from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Live from the beautiful grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. And when I say the beautiful grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club, we're all reminded of what a club is. A club is a community. And uh, the community has a kind of a life of its own in that we get together for events, dinners, parties, and luncheons. And as um, a community, that community includes the members and just as importantly, the wives and the children of the members. And all of us together, um, with these events that we spend with each other create kind of a glue that is the social fabric of the club. I mention all this because one amongst us, a frequent attendee of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, passed away yesterday. She was the wife of Staff Commodore Bruce Monroe, and of course I mean Lindy Monroe. She was a frequent attendant, not just of this luncheon, but of all kinds of Yakov events, supported her husband's incredibly solid, thoughtful work as chief counsel for the club and then as commodore of the Yacht Club, and went on numerous cruises and participated. And yesterday, with surrounded by her family, she passed along. And so I'd like for us to share a quiet moment in honor of Lynn Monroe. And so, Linny, we'll all remember you. It was great to have you in our Yacht Club. A little bit about our speaker today. So when you think back to being a young kid, our speaker today began her interest in her field at age 10. She went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and she looked inside of one of these big aquariums and was completely fascinated by the fact that an octopus had eyes and looked back at her. And she began thinking, wait a minute, I'm looking through this piece of glass at the octopus, but the octopus is looking back at me. What's that octopus thinking? What is that octopus doing? What's he going to do now that he's been looking at me or she? And so our speaker decided at that moment that this was going to be what she would call her life's work. And so after getting a bachelor's degree in creative studies at UC Santa Barbara, if I was the father paying the bills, I'd say, what? That sounds like a cushy vacation. Some of us pay our own bills. Some of us pay our own bills. Aha. Uh -huh. This is news to a father of four children who've all gone through too many levels of college at, at somebody else's expense. At any rate, uh, so from a degree that sounds an, awfully lot, an awful lot like a brilliantly well-planned vacation, I mean, a BA in Creative Studies at UC Santa Barbara, everybody should sign up for one of those. Uh, she then went on in serious work to get a PhD at Stanford. And uh, her, her thesis, I'm going to summarize as squid, sex, and babies. But to tell us all about why she's so interested in octopuses all these years and what they do with each other, please welcome our speaker today, Dana Staff. Thank you so much, Ron, for that very creative introduction. It's a joy to be here. Um, hello, and thank you to everybody here in the physical audience. Um, hello, and thank you to everybody watching on a screen, wherever you may be now or in the future. So I was thinking about the last time that I was in a yacht club, and it's been a little while. It was the Toyon Bay Yacht Club. Has anyone ever heard of that one? Does anyone know where Toyon Bay is? Yes, it is on Catalina Island, and the Toyon Bay Yacht Club is part of the Catalina Sea Camp. So I was a kid at Catalina Sea Camp, maybe 13 or 14 years old, uh, learning how to sail in the Toyon Bay Yacht Club. We were required to come up with sail names for ourselves. And the very first time that I was allowed to go out on a boat with another kid, the two of us as partners, um, just going out sailing, we got blown out of the bay and had to be towed back by one of the instructors coming after us, which gave me my sail name, Lost at Sea, which became how I was known at the Toyon Bay Yacht Club for the rest of my tenure there. Um, 
As you may have surmised, I was not invited here for my questionable sailing credentials, although I did learn to sail a little bit better than that first excursion, but rather for my unassailable, <laughs> thank you, octopus expertise. And I wanted to bring to you today the story of the one and only sailing octopus, which is also known as an argonaut, and how the story of this octopus intertwines with the history of the invention of the modern aquarium, which is in turn what made it possible for me to meet an octopus at age 10 and become an octopus researcher and ambassador for the rest of my life. So it all comes full circle. So I'm going to introduce a tiny bit of octopus anatomy that will be useful as we go on. So this is in some ways a classic octopus and it has classic octopus features. Here, for example, is the eye. All octopuses have very sophisticated eyes that are image forming. They have a lens and a cornea and can look around and take in the world much like our own eyes do. Um, it has a mantle, which is this big floppy part of the body that has all of the organs in it, the gills, the hearts, there are three hearts, the kidneys, everything else. It has a funnel, sometimes also called a siphon, which is how octopuses swim, as well as squids and other members of the group called cephalopods. They pull water into the mantle and squeeze it out the siphon. And just like holding a fire hose pushes you backwards, pointing the siphon in a particular direction pushes the octopus in the other direction. They swim by jet propulsion. Now, we also have the animal's beak right here in the middle of all of the arms. That's where they take bites of their food. They have a beak rather similar to a bird's. And then, of course, probably the feature for which octopuses are most famous, their eight arms. Um, but as you can tell, two of these arms are much different from the others. And that is what makes the argonaut or the sailing octopus different from all of the other octopuses in the world, is these two amazing arms that are highly expanded into membranes. And a lot of my story today is about figuring out what they do with these membranes that look a lot like sails. This is a picture of two live Argonaut octopuses, one of them holding on to each other. They are octopuses that live in the water. They swim around and they have shells. That's another part that I kind of forgot to point out because it's so obviously unusual. Each Argonaut octopus lives inside a shell and they carry it around with them as they swim through the water, as they cling to each other, as they cling to little bits of seagrass or kelp or whatever they might encounter in their environment. And as you can also see here, the arms are generally all tucked in. So it's hard to count that there are eight of them. It's hard to see those two weird membranes. They're all squinched in together. And so today, luckily, because we have scuba divers with underwater photography, because we have remotely operated vehicles and submersibles taking beautiful footage, we actually have a lot of photos and footage of Argonauts doing this kind of thing underwater. But hundreds of years ago, before it was possible to take cameras underwater, most people saw Argonauts looking more like this, where they were out of the water, often they were already dead, they'd been pulled out of their shells, and they'd been spread out. And so instead of seeing what their behavior was like, people saw what their anatomy was like, and they had to make guesses from the anatomy what sort of behavior they had. And this was the predominant guess. They thought they have these huge arms, they must be sails and they must hold them in the air over their heads to catch the wind, and this lovely shell must be just like a boat, and they sit in their little boat, and they put their sails in the air, and the wind blows them along the surface of the sea. And it was such a beautiful story that despite the fact that nobody had ever seen any octopus doing this, it persisted for hundreds of years. Um, even as late as Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, relatively late. I'm talking like 1871 here. This uh, woodcut is showing the men of the Nautilus submarine hanging out on the surface and seeing a whole fleet of sailing Argonauts floating across the sea. Um, it's hardly the only fictional part of that book, so I'm not too up in arms about it, but I do think that it's important to get this historical context before we see what happened um, to help us understand how the Argonauts actually use those huge membranes and what they're doing with that shell.
this is the Nautilus. Uh, it usually was used to refer to the shell starting in about 1600 because the shells would sometimes wash up empty on beaches. People would collect them. Naturalists like to put them in their cabinets and show them off for guests. Um, the animal itself would often die and be discarded. So this is a Nautilus, um, the shell. A little bit later, European explorers started sending back shells that looked kind of like this from the Indo-Pacific. This may be what you're more used to thinking of as a nautilus, if you have ever seen one before. Um, this is a shell made by an animal that's in the same group as octopuses and squid. It's another cephalopod. Um, it has a lot of tentacles instead of just eight, and it has a very much simpler eye. But the end result is that it produces a shell, just like the nautilus that people were familiar with in the Mediterranean, so they called it the same thing. And then this guy came along, Carl Linnaeus, and decided everything should have a name, everything in its place, let's not overlap names. And so he came up with a new name for the Nautilus that lived in the Mediterranean that he was familiar with, that all the other European scientists were familiar with. And so he named it Argonauta because the Argonauts were sailors on the Mediterranean. They were sailors from the ship Argo, from the myth of Jason and the Golden Fleece, which mythologically speaking was thought to be the first ship on the Mediterranean, in some tellings of the myth anyway. So Argonauts are the first sailors, according to Linnaeus, and then that means that these tropical shells get to keep the name Nautilus. So great, okay, we have a little bit of disambiguation, but the problem is it takes people a long time to pick up on new terminology, and so people started just calling them both Nautilus, but with an extra modifier. So we have Paper Nautilus and Pearly Nautilus. The Paper Nautilus got its name because this shell is very thin. You may recall from that first slide I showed that you could see the octopus through it, it's kind of translucent, and this Argonaut octopus makes a very, very thin and very, very fragile shell. Whereas the pearly or chambered nautilus, the animal that lives in most of the tropical waters around the Indo-Pacific, makes a very thick and sturdy seashell. It's like the thickest snail shell you can imagine picking up on the beach from a sea snail or like a clam shell or a, a mussel shell, something like that. It's very sturdy. And it has that same nacre or mother of pearl in it that a mussel or an abalone or something like that has. So they're sometimes called pearly nautiluses or chambered nautiluses. I would like to try to convince people to stop calling the very delicate Argonaut a nautilus at all. We're just not going to use paper nautilus anymore because it's too confusing. So we're going to stick with Argonaut from now on for that thin, delicate shell found around the Mediterranean and keep nautilus for those very thick, pearly shells. Now I'm going to put these two animals next to each other so we can do a little more comparison. They don't look very similar, really. <laughs> you can see that the eyes are different. The eye of the nautilus, which is over here, is what's called a pinhole. And so it doesn't have a complex lens or cornea like our own eyes or like the eye of the octopus does. Um, it is much less sophisticated. It can't take as complex an image. Um, they instead perceive their environment largely through their tentacles, of which they can have dozens, sometimes up to 90. And these tentacles are covered with chemical sensory structures that we're only just beginning to understand. The shells, as you can tell, uh, we have this very thick shell. This one's been somewhat damaged, so you can actually see all of the layers that go into the construction of a true nautilus shell. Whereas this shell of the Argonaut is showing off how thin and translucent and delicate it is. And this started a debate that the rest of my talk is going to be about. Because nautiluses, we know, make their own shells. They're just like an abalone or a clam or, heck, a garden snail. If you try to take them apart, you can see they're attached to their shell. They make it bigger as they get bigger. It's part of their body. It's part of themselves. They grow it. Nobody knew if that was true for Argonauts. And this was, became a source of some contention. Like they can crawl right out of their shells. I've seen them do it and then climb back in. So they're clearly not connected to it. Their body isn't coiled and shaped the same way that the shell is. So let me get into the core of the debate here. These were really the three points that made a lot of early scientists say Argonauts are like hermit crabs. They steal shells from somebody else. But this hermit crab did not make the shell that it's hanging out in. Yes, this guy right here is a hermit crab. 
and the crab inside has no ability to make a shell like this. It has a great ability to find an empty shell and cram itself inside it, or to steal a shell from another hermit crab. And so a lot of people thought that Argonauts were doing the same thing because they can crawl in and out of their shells. They'll crawl out, find somebody else's shell, and steal it. The argument against this, however, was that Nautiluses are similar to Argonauts. The shell looks similar. They're both cephalopods, this group of animals with tentacles. Um, and if Nautiluses can make shells, why can't Argonauts? And perhaps most importantly, no other animal was ever found inside this shell. So like this shell, for example, currently has a snail inside it that made the shell. But later you might find it with a hermit crab inside it after the snail dies. These Argonaut shells only ever had Argonaut octopuses in them. That was it. And so that, so people said, okay, they must make it themselves. Also, one time some guy said he saw baby Argonauts with shells inside their eggs. Um, now, they couldn't be stealing a shell from outside of their egg and stuffing it inside their egg. So that was considered pretty good evidence that they made it themselves. But we have to remember that all of this is armchair science. It's all... European scientists mostly sitting in their rooms with their cabinets of curiosities, which are full of dead animals preserved in jars and empty shells, hypothesizing about the behavior of real animals. So here's where somebody came along and said, no, we need to figure out what's really going on here. And this woman, whose name is Jeanne Villepru Power, solved the mystery of the Argonauts by also inventing something that hadn't even existed before. So I'm just going to quickly teach everybody how to pronounce her name because this was a big part of writing a book about her, is I had to learn how to pronounce it because I'm not a native French speaker and it was tricky for me. So if there are native French speakers in the audience, please forgive me in advance as I butcher this language, trying to make it rhyme with words in English. Jeanne rhymes with Ben, more or less. This is Ben Franklin, to help us remember that. Ville rhymes with eel the long wiggly fish. Pur is just very French and doesn't rhyme with anything, so you just move past it very quickly and move on to power, which is a perfectly good English word. You'll learn in a minute why she had an English word as part of her French name. The whole thing all together is Jeanne Villepreux power. And Jeanne was born in France just before the French Revolution in the beautiful French countryside in a time when most children did not go to school in this environment. She grew up taking care of her family's farm, taking care of all of her younger siblings because she was the oldest. But she did have one unusual feature, was that she had a mother who knew how to read in a time when it was quite unusual for women to know that even as adults. And her mother who knew how to read and write taught Jeanne how to read and write. Here's a little drawing of her as a little girl learning to read and write. This was She was born in 1794. Um, and as she grew up, we know very little about her young life, but we know that she was curious and creative and independent. And when she was 17, she decided to walk to Paris and start a new life for herself. Now, Paris was a very interesting place at the time. It took her a couple of weeks to walk there, and she had some misadventures along the way, but she finally made it um, to find a place that it was very obvious that Europe was at war. And she lived in Paris through the Napoleonic rise to power, through the Napoleonic wars, um, managed to stay out of trouble and find herself a job as a seamstress. And she was so good at it that she became one of the most famous seamstresses in London. And so when the monarchy was restored and the new French king was marrying off his nephew to a princess from Sicily to try to reestablish the power of the monarchy, they hired Jeanne to make the wedding dress. So this is a drawing of the princess's wedding gown, completely designed and crafted by Jeanne Villepreux. Not much of a naturalist yet, but clearly a very inventive, very capable, and uh, very curious person. She's, she's willing to sort of reach out and find things out for herself when she wants to. And this wedding dress connected her with her future husband, who was a merchant from Sicily who had come to Paris with a whole retinue of Sicilians with the princess for the wedding. He met Jeanne. They fell in love. And they got married and moved together to Messina in Sicily. This is not what it looked like at the time. This is a modern photo. But I think it was, it was probably just as beautiful, if not more so. Um, and so this was a whole new life for Jeanne. Up until this point, she had had to support herself, to take care of her family, to take care of herself. And now she was married to a wealthy merchant. 
she had a lot of resources and a lot of time at her disposal. And she loved her new environment. We already know that she was pretty good at walking. Uh, so she walked all over the island of Sicily, gathered rocks and fossils and animals and uh, and she looked at the ruins and she taught herself ancient Greek and Latin so she could decode the inscriptions on them. And she wrote this guide to Sicily in Italian, which she had now learned as well, which was so comprehensive and so useful that it was actually reissued. This, this was published in 1842. This was uh, sort of a second edition that after her first one. And it was republished in 1995. Um, obviously, uh, some of the references were out of date, but the whole, as a whole, it was still so relevant and interesting that, that it got that republication, which I think is very cool. So she had all these collections. She was getting into natural history, obviously. Um, and if you were interested in biology, interested in animals at the time, you built yourself one of these. I mentioned it earlier, a cabinet of curiosities, um, full of all of the fossils and rocks and animals that you had killed and preserved and dried out. So Jeanne did it. That was what you did. Um, but she also wasn't very satisfied with it because she could tell that the animals when they were alive were way more interesting. So she started keeping some very interesting pets. Um, one of the first may have been a bit of an accident. Uh, she had one of these little turtles. And she says in her own writings that she had been intending to embalm it, to preserve it, to put in her cabinet of curiosities. But uh, she had run out of the fluid that she needed to make, the preservative, because you couldn't just order it from a catalog back then. You had to be a chemist and make it yourself. So Jeanne was off being a chemist and mixing up some more of her preservative. And she just dropped this guy into a jar of alcohol temporary preservative while she was mixing up the formalin. Apparently the next day she found her little turtle just wandering around the house, at which point she adopted it as her pet, named it Mignon, which means like little or cute, and, uh, and began to do behavioral experiments, figuring out that it would respond to its name, figuring out which desserts it liked best to eat. Um, I, this story was so bonkers to me when I read it that I reached out to a herpetologist, somebody who specializes in reptiles, and I said, is it possible that a turtle could survive overnight immersion in alcohol and start wandering around the house? And he said, absolutely, turtles are really gnarly. So professional opinion of a herpetologist, turtles are gnarly. She also, on purpose, kept a couple of live pine martens, which are similar to ferrets or weasels. Uh, and this is where her... her power and privilege as a wealthy woman in Sicily really came into its own uh, because she had servants that would help her feed these animals and help her return all of the things that they stole from the neighbors when they got out of her house. And she even decided that she wanted to watch them hunt like they would in nature, but she wanted to do it in a controlled setting, in a, essentially a laboratory setting. So this is early behavioral research, behavioral ecology. So she had a tree put into her living room. So that she, because they're, they're climbers, as you can see, this, um, this fellow is climbing very happily on a tree. So she had the tree in the living room. She paid all the little children of Messina to go out and collect birds for her. She brought them into her house, released the birds, watched the Pine Martins hunt the birds. I think she sent the kids away before the, all the murder and blood started. Um, but it's hard to be sure. So that's all very good. Um, but she's living here on an island on the beautiful coast. And above all, she wants to know more about the animals in the water. So she starts to go out tide pooling, um, talking to all the fishermen, asking them about the most interesting things that there are coming up in their nets. And she begins to also research aquatic marine life. These are four species that she spent a lot of time on. This one is called a triton in the upper left here, a triton snail. They can get quite large, bigger than you could hold in your hand. And she found that they could regenerate, um, that she was able to cut off a part of their head and they would grow it back. Um, this is a different kind of snail, marine snail, called the canoe bubble snail that has this big sort of um, cloudy, cloud-like foot that it can't even stuff back into its shell. Um, and she figured out what they liked to eat, which had been a mystery before then, and how much they could eat at different times in their life. This is a little shrimp. Here's the shrimp over here. This is a mother shrimp. These are all of her eggs laid out in a very tidy ring. And this barrel that the eggs are in is a different animal called a salp, which looks a bit like a jellyfish. It's a transparent blobby thing in the ocean, but it's actually more closely related to us humans. 
which is a whole other story we could get into. But anyway, what happens is that mom shrimp, as Jen discovered by looking very closely, takes a live salp, hollows it out, and uses it as a nursery for her eggs. And the, this type of shrimp is now called a pram shrimp in honor of this very specific and very bizarre behavior. And um, again, you can see lots more photos of them than there used to be because now we have underwater cameras and lots of scuba divers taking cool photos. And then, of course, she could not fail but be fascinated by the octopuses. So this is a common octopus from the Mediterranean, um, and she spent a while studying them and figuring out that they could use tools to open shells to get their prey out. But of course, the octopus that she was most fascinated by was that Argonaut octopus. And all of these animals she wanted to keep in her home, just like she did with the pine martens and with the tortoise. But even a tree isn't good enough for keeping marine animals. What do you need to keep them? You need water. They need to be underwater. And so Jen had to invent the very first marine aquarium. This is the closest I've been able to find to a picture of her early aquariums. Um, we don't have a lot of data from these, this early work that she did. I drew this picture based on what she wrote about it, but a lot of her writings, her specimens, and her research was lost in a shipwreck later in her life. So researching her and putting together the book that I wrote about her has been this adventure in stitching together bits and pieces from here and there. So this is an aquarium that was designed probably based on Jeanne's designs a decade or two later. And you can see that it's a mix of different animals and algae and rocks in there. And Jeanne used these to study all kinds of marine animals like these sea, uh, sea stars here that she's looking at how they eat. She also designed something that at the time scientists were even more excited about. It was this cage that could be anchored to the seafloor. So this was a wooden cage with enough space between the slats for water to flow through. And she would sink it in the harbor of Messina, take these anchors and attach them to the rocks and sand and mud on the seafloor. And then she could put animals in here. And it's like um, modern behavioral ecologists and behavioral scientists use things like this as uh, sort of enclosure experiments in the wild. And the advantage you get compared to keeping something in an aquarium in your house is, for one thing, you know that the water is exactly what they would be encountering in the wild because it's flowing through there all the time. They're going to have the same temperature, the same chemistry, the same amount of oxygen, all that stuff. Um, and for another, uh, anything that they produce, like waste, is going to get flushed out. And in particular for octopuses, this is very important because octopuses produce ink as a defensive mechanism when they get upset. And ink in the wild is not a problem for them because the currents carry it away. But ink in an enclosed aquarium is really bad for them to breathe. Um, and so this kind of setup was perfect for her to keep octopuses in. And in particular, she kept Argonauts in it. Um, this is a little drawing from the top down of Jeanne in one of her research boats. And under the water here, she would have had one of these cages. And she could open the lid and reach in and feed her Argonauts. And finally, this gave her the setup she needed to set to rest that age-old question of are Argonauts thieves like hermit crabs? Or do they are they creators like snails? Do they make their shell or do they steal it? And she started off by taking Argonauts and keeping them alive in these cages so she could watch them day after day after day. And she broke their shells. And when she looked at the animals with the broken shells day after day, she found that they repaired their shells. And in particular, they repaired the breaks in their shells by spreading those huge membranous arms over the shell and secreting from the arm itself a new material to stitch it together. She also was able to keep them alive long enough to watch them through their life cycle. So she was able to test that theory of do the babies start the shell in the egg? And interestingly, they don't start it in the egg. So that early observation was wrong. Inside the egg, they just look like little octopuses. But as soon as they hatch, 
this is a very recently hatched Argonaut. And I'm going to sort of walk you through it because it's a pretty weird thing to look at. But here's the eye. And then so here's the funnel or siphon coming down here. And the arms, the beak is right there. And the arms are sort of reaching back from the beak. They're curved back around the body. And in particular, these two long arms with the big membranes are curved back over the head. And the membranes are spread around the mantle. And they're secreting a shell. There's a little baby shell being secreted underneath those arms. And as they get bigger, this is still a young Argonaut, but an older one with the arms partly spread and partly retracted. So you can see the shell here. And then this part of it, this shell continues all the way around, but it's partially covered by the arms that are going to keep growing it and on and on and on as the animal gets bigger. So what Jen was able to prove is that Argonauts are not hermit crabs. They're not thieves. <laughs> they shouldn't be arrested for theft of other mollusks' property. Um, but she also found that they're not really like snails either, because snails, as we talked about a little bit, are attached to their shells. They are using their main part of their body to secrete that shell, and it's continuously attached to it. If you try to separate them, you kill the snail. So Argonauts aren't really like that either. Um, the ability of an Argonaut to produce a shell from its arms, to which it is not connected, and it can climb in and out, is really mostly like Spider-Man, in the sense that they're producing a material from their arms rather than from any part of the body that any other animal has been known to produce. And they can connect to it, disconnect from it, grow it, shrink it, whatever they need to do with it. And so Jen, having proved her point, she didn't know about Spider-Man at the time. Uh, he hadn't been discovered yet. But she did love her Argonauts, and she made at least one beautiful watercolor painting that did survive through the shipwreck. So this is Jen's art of the Argonaut in, sort of retracted inside of its shell. And she really wanted to emphasize this point that they exist in their natural environment. And so rather than draw it spread out and pinned and dried, she placed it in the environment that it would be in with barnacles and corals and all of the, the things that it shares its life with. And through her paintings, because she couldn't take photographs yet, um, and her data and all of her papers, she thought, I've got it. This age-old question is going to be set to rest, and people are going to stop arguing about Argonauts. Now, there was still a significant impediment to her getting the word out, and that is that it was 18... 30, 1840, and women were not admitted into most scientific societies. Um, this is the Royal Society in London, which was one of the, if not the most prominent scientific societies where scientists shared information and read papers and argued about things. And they didn't even admit female members until 1945 which blew my mind when I found that out. Um, there were some more forward-thinking and progressing so progressive societies that actually did allow Jen to join. She joined a local society in Sicily, another one um, on mainland Italy, and she was also fortunate and determined enough to make friends in the Royal Society and convince them to present her results for her. And in particular, Richard Owen, who became famous for coining the word dinosaur and, uh, and doing a lot of cool paleontological research and also kind of being a jerk, um, was actually pretty nice to Jen and helped her to present her research and get her legitimate credit for the things that she did. So here's a quick little timeline. We've got Jeanne inventing her first aquariums in 1832, and then she spent the rest of the 1830s using them to resolve this question of the Argonauts, as well as to study the snails and the uh, sea stars and all that other cool stuff. Um, it was kind of in the zeitgeist, um, as was a lot of women push, pushing back against their historic exclusion from science. There was another cool woman that I could give a whole different cool talk about named Anna Thin, who in England was keeping corals alive in something called a balanced aquarium, which Jen wasn't particularly interested in because she lived in Messina. She lived right next to the ocean. So it was really relatively easy for her to get seawater, fresh seawater into her aquariums. But Anna lived in London. Um, which is a little bit of a drive from the ocean, and it was hard for her to get fresh seawater, and so she actually worked out that if you kept the right balance of animals and algae in an aquarium, they would feed off of each other, one of them producing oxygen
oxygen in the other, producing carbon dioxide, the waste products of one becoming the, um, the sort of intake of the other. And she was able to keep these corals going for a really long time um, in her London apartments. So, coral, so aquariums were getting very popular thanks to the work of these two women as well as a number of other people. There was a whole aquarium craze sweeping across Europe and North America. In 1853, we finally got a word for it. Before that, people were calling them all kinds of things. They were calling them cages or glass boxes or vivariums. Um, Philip Henry Goss coined the word aquarium as a shortening of aquatic vivarium. Um, when he was working on the fish house for the London Zoo, which became a sensation, it drove the aquarium craze even higher. And uh, Jeanne was aware that a lot of people didn't know that she had invented these things. And so she wrote to her friend Richard Owen and said, I need some credit here. Um, there's no copyright office that I can write to, but you're pretty well known. Can you lend me a hand? Um, and he put her name in the Encyclopedia Britannica when he was writing entries for it in 1858. Um, so she did, in her lifetime, become credited as the inventor of the aquarium. Um, unfortunately, over the next hundred years, her name has been largely forgotten uh, thanks to a variety of influences, like a couple of world wars that threw a lot of the record keeping in Europe into chaos, um, not to mention recurrent sexism in various industries. But I'm really excited to be bringing her story back to people um, I have written a whole book about her, which is the first full-length biography called The Lady and the Octopus. Plus, of course, we have as her legacy, even though her name isn't associated with them, all these public aquariums throughout the world, um, which I think she would be really happy to know about, um, whether or not she got credited with it. Just that so many people are able, like I was when I was a child, to go to an aquarium and see animals alive that otherwise we would only be seeing as shells or as dead animals or as drawings. Um, but this really brings that incredible diversity of marine life to people all over the world. And I think that's really cool. Another interesting legacy, this time more of the octopuses themselves than of Jen, is that Argonaut octopuses have remained incredibly mysterious. Even though she solved one big mystery, she proved they make their own shells, she proved how they do it, she proved what those weird arms are for, they're for making a shell. Um, the shell itself and the octopus in it has been continued to be mysterious because, among other things, we didn't totally know what that shell was for. We knew it wasn't a boat for floating at the surface. That was settled. Um, we knew that only the female Argonauts make them and they put their eggs in it. So it's clearly some kind of egg case. Um, but what else does it do if it gets filled with air as it sometimes does? Is that deadly for the octopuses? Why do they strand sometimes? Because there are sometimes mass strandings of dozens or even hundreds of Argonauts that wash up on shore. Lots and lots of open questions. Um, and just relatively recently, in 2010, one of those was solved. Um, we knew that the Argonaut shell is not like a sailboat, but it turned out with some new research that came out, it is rather more like a different kind of boat. It's more like a submersible. So the shell is not just for eggs, and this actually is a, is a mother Argonaut that has her eggs here. These, these small white bundles here are the eggs of the mother Argonaut. But she's also using the shell itself as a vessel for movement, not at the surface, but at depth, and it's keeping her neutrally buoyant. Now, neutral buoyancy is crucial for scuba divers, for submersibles, for anybody going underwater, because you want to be able to stay at one depth without having to constantly swim to stay down because you're, you're trying to float because your body is so buoyant, or swim to stay up because you're so heavy, gravity's trying to pull you down. Neutral buoyancy means you can just stay wherever you are. And uh, submersibles and divers achieve it through complicated mixes of having pockets of gas, having a buoyancy control vest, having weights in your pockets or weights around your ankles. And the Argonaut octopus does it by taking her shell up to the surface on purpose taking a little bubble of air, she sort of opens up, moves her body out so that an air bubble goes inside the shell, and then she closes it off with her body and swims down. 
And air, as you go deeper underwater, gets compressed by the pressure around it. And as she goes down, that bubble of air gets compressed, 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 until it's just the right size and density to offset the weight of her body. And at exactly that point, she stops swimming down and starts swimming horizontally. And she has achieved neutral buoyancy. I just think it's so cool. <laughs> I know, no weight belt required, no buoyancy control vest. Um, so, uh, so this was discovered, as I said, just in 2010. Um, there's still, the stranding question is still an open one. Um, so, you know, you may see a news story in five years or 10 years solving that one too. And um, I just think that they are pretty much the neatest things. And uh, with that, I thought I would wrap up a little early so that I could take questions because that's my favorite part is getting people's questions in. And my last slide, I just wanted to, uh, this, is, this is required for an author. I have to show you pictures of all my books. Uh, the Lady and the Octopus is the one that I wrote about Jeanne and the Argonauts. And on the sides are the other two books, Monarchs of the Sea is about all cephalopods ever, including the giants that lived before the dinosaurs. And Nursery Earth is about all baby animals ever, from the cute to the disgusting. So thank you all so, so, so much for listening. So are all octopuses Argonauts? No, all, Only... oct all Argonauts are octopuses. So Argonauts are a subset of species within the within the octopus world. Right, within world. the group of octopuses. Right, okay. and other octopuses include the giant Pacific octopus, which you've probably seen if you've ever been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, the, I mean, there's, there's so many. The blue-ringed octopus, which is the most deadly octopus in the world, lives in Australia. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different cool species of octopuses, and Argonauts are. Now, before I ask the question about what octopuses eat, I want to say, what a lunch. What's happening is Aaron, our chef, is doing masterful stuff with the buffet lunches at the St. Francis. And, like, the pork was fantastic, the salmon was fantastic. Let's give a hand for Aaron, the chef. Good going, buddy. So, uh, yes, Kathy Trafton has a question, our vice chairman Action. of the committee. Dana, that was wonderful. Thank I you. loved your talk. Thank I you. I have a couple questions, sort of related, but not terribly. So presumably these little tiny Argonauts are born and they get bigger and they must outgrow their shells. Do they break their shells and regenerate their shells? Do they abandon them? Do, I mean, wouldn't you think a hermit crab might crawl into that? That's my first question. And my second question, I noticed you say octopuses. <laughs> Shall we talk about how we pluralize the octopus? Let's talk about both of those things. They are okay. excellent questions. This is why it's my favorite part. People always have such good questions. So the first one is they actually, just like a snail, keep making their shell bigger as they grow, which is why the coil works so well, because coiling the shell allows you to have this shape that just scales with your body, New rings, new rings, is that what happens? Essentially, yeah. But they don't seal off the old part, which okay. Which a nautilus does. That's one of the reasons they're called chambered nautiluses. If you've cut a nautilus shell in half, you'll see walls from the smaller to the bigger where they sealed it off. But an argonaut, if you cut it in half, you just see it's just continuous. But as their body gets bigger, they don't live in the tiny part anymore. They just live in the bigger part. And to the question of plurals, so I did happen to mention that I'm a little bit of a language nerd. So the word octopus comes from ancient Greek, from two ancient Greek roots, octo, meaning eight, and pus, which is foot. Pus, however, is not the root. The root itself is pod, that means foot. And the shortening of it to pus happens because, because nouns in the nominative singular in ancient Greek get a single S on the ending, which is P-O-D-S. And one of the linguistic rules is that DS together become a single S. You lose the D, and the vowel before the D changes. So pods becomes pus. It's just part of the weird linguistic quirks of ancient Greek. But the root is still pod. So the plural is ES, and nothing weird happens when you put ES on the end of pod. There's no weird rule. So you just get P O D E S, podis. And so if you're following the linguistic rules of ancient Greek, the correct plural of octopus is octopodes which is fun to I knew, say. I, I knew that. We should all say it together. It's really fun. Octopodes. So that's what you can say when you really, really want to confuse people. Um, however, I tend to pluralize it like an ordinary English word on account of the fact that we're speaking English. And so I pluralize it to octopuses. 
which is what nearly all octopus scientists I've ever spoken to do. Um, octopuses is, is just sort of the like classic plural that you'll get if you go to a conference. The one that people often like to use that is wrong is octopi. Um, yeah. But honestly, like, what is wrong? It, the English language is full of weird things. The reason that we like it is that the ending U.S. exists also in ancient Latin. So even though octopus is not from Latin, the U.S. ending reminds us of other Latin words, and the plural of that U.S. ending is I. So, for example, cactus, cacti, which give, would give you octopus, octopi. Um, I mean, I should also add here that the ancient Greeks didn't call them octopuses. That was sort of a later construction. The ancient Greeks called them polyps. I am so glad you clarified that. <laughs> should I keep talking about it? Do you need another 15 minutes? Hangs up for people who failed and said octopi. <laughs> no judgment. You okay, can keep so, doing it if it makes you happy. So how, how long... How old is an old octopus? How long do they live? They have really short lifespans, shorter than I think most of us would expect. So, uh, shorter than that answer we just had? <laughs> no. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. So the biggest, oldest octopus uh, is still going to be less than 10 years. Uh, the giant Pacific octopus usually doesn't live more than five. I love how much knowledge you have. One of the great things That's about such a kind way to put it <laughs> about a Wednesday yachting luncheon is we learn all this stuff from fascinating people. So you said there are male and female octopuses, and um, and you, I said, uh, and, and they have they have some mating game. How often do they mate? Uh, so here's a question: Are we talking about argonauts or octopuses? Because I want to make sure. So argonauts are a subset. Argonaut, of Argonaut. Thank you, remember. argonauts. Argonauts specifically. The male can only mate once. The female can mate multiple times throughout her life. That's not fair. And it gets worse. This comic by the uh, inimitable artist Rob Lang really sums it up. But I'm going to add some more words because as you found out, that's what I do. So Argonaut octopuses <laughs> as adults come in the large shelled female variety and the tiny no shelled male variety. Um, and the males, in fact, were not recognized for a long time. In Jen's time, nobody had ever seen them. All they had seen were these weird little parasitic worms inside the shells of the females. And on the top of this slide, the sort of white, wormy looking thing is what I'm talking about. People would find several of these inside the shell of a female Argonaut. And they had to assume they were worms. They do have suckers all along them. And so good old Linnaeus, I think it was him, gave them the name Hectocotylus, which means hundred suckered thing. Um, and everyone figured they were parasites. But these are actually babies? Well, it turns out they are one arm of the male. And it is a huge arm. You can see in the draw in the photograph below with the sort of yellowish picture, that's a male Argonaut. And you can kind of see that he's got a big lumpy balloon thing with all of his other arms. And you can also see it in the drawing. The male, which is the smaller octopus in the cartoon that doesn't have a shell, has kind of a like lump that looks like a balloon or a tumor. So inside that lump, he keeps his biggest arm. The biggest arm. His biggest arm. And he packs it full of sperm. Hmm. And then when he finds a female that he's ready to mate with, that arm breaks off completely and swims over to the female and lives inside her shell. That's, I, I can't relate to that last part. Okay. Did, didn't learn how to swim? How long do the babies, af after this, what a giving character. It's beautiful. It's really Men beautiful. Are this species. Yeah. yeah. Um, how long do the babies stay with the moms? They will develop in usually a matter of weeks. And so, so to connect the dots there, the female ends up with usually several arms preloaded with sperm that she can then choose from when she uh, lays her eggs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lots of female choice going on here. Um, speaking of like open questions, nobody really knows how she, like does she remember this one came from the really cute guy and this one came from the really fast guy? Like we have no idea. Did she get the name? <laughs> Wait, oh no! Did she, did she make a little note on each of the arms? Anyway, so she mixes that with her eggs. 
gets fertilized eggs that she is keeping inside of her shell, and the embryos inside those eggs are developing for a couple of weeks until they hatch. And once they hatch, they pretty much are on their own. They'll spend maybe a day or two either in the shell or nearby, but they're not. She's not going to feed them. She's not going. It's not like a, a mom bird bringing worms to the baby birds. They're pretty much on their own from then on out. What do they eat? What do octopuses eat? Most octopuses, well, all octopuses are carnivores, and most of them are predators. Some of them are scavengers, so they all have to eat meat, basically. Um, but they'll happily, most of them will happily scavenge it if it's something that's already dead. Um, and then a lot of them will hunt for it. And that's what, what the babies are doing, is hunting for very, very tiny meat, like the smallest shrimp you've ever seen. And so who are the predators, if that's what they eat? Who are the predators? Yeah, and so they themselves are being hunted by everything big enough to eat them, including other octopuses. Got it. The deadliest octopodes live in the antipodes. <laughs> good, good, good one, Lance. <laughs> that's recorded, right? Yeah, it's recorded. I'm here on Wednesdays. <laughs> uh, I seem to remember um, at the California Academy of Sciences, which has a giant Pacific op octopus, that they say their octopus has a sense of humor and is playful. Is this something, can you speak a little bit about that, how they know that, and is this something that's shared amongst other octopodes? including the Argonaut. The, uh, the question of octopus personality and octopus play uh, has gotten a lot of attention, I think deservedly so, because yeah. that moment of connection that I felt of the octopus looking back at me, I think a lot of people will have that at some time or another with an octopus where we'll recognize them doing some behavior or engaging in something that feels familiar to us. It's in CNN every night, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a couple of documentaries. There's My Octopus Teacher. There's uh, An Octopus in My Living Room. Or I can't remember what that one was called, but it's a professor in Alaska who kept an octopus in his living room. So, you know, this is a little bit, just, just like one step below international relations there, <laughs> level of attention. Um, but they, uh, the the evidence that they have personalities is very strong. Like aquarists who work with octopuses, because they have this short life cycle, a single aquarist is going to work with many octopuses over the years because each one is only living for a couple of years in captivity, just naturally. That's how long their life cycle, their lifespan is. And so they find that there are shy octopuses and there are more outgoing octopuses and there are more playful octopuses. And the sort of things that get categorized as play are basically behaviors that don't direct bring anything like food or a mate or safety or defense. Uh, something like, for example, octopuses using their siphons to squirt a jet of water to bounce a ball against the wall of their aquarium, for example, which is something that has been observed. And so it's all, it all has to be extrapolation to a certain extent because we came up with the definition of play as humans for things that we humans do. So I always think there's a really interesting question of balancing, looking at other animals and saying that's play. On one hand, it could be seen as anthropomorphizing. We're taking our own human ideas and pushing them onto that animal that maybe doesn't need them. But on the other hand, I think we're also expanding our human ideas and realizing that things like tool use are not limited to humans. We, we know for a fact now that many other species of animals clearly use, take, will, take some object, modify that object even, and then use it to accomplish a task. And it used to be some decades ago that we thought only humans ever did that. So I think it's a, it's a great space to be in and to kind of be balancing and asking those philosophical questions. So to the, his question, to Lance's question about humor, so how do we know or identify the behavior as humorous? I don't know. I'd, I'd want to ask the, the Aquarist in that case, honestly. The, so, yeah. Okay, so do, do octopuses make sounds? Mm. That is a very good question. They don't. Is the short answer? Do you want the long answer too? How do they? How do they? <laughs> how do they? Do they communicate with each other? The communication with each other is highly visual, and so the skin. They're Italian. 
Yeah. <laughs> the the skin and the gestures that they use, they can change incredibly fast. So the colors and textures on their skin are all completely under the control of their brain, under, under direct nervous control. So their nervous system can change colors to either match the background for camouflage or to send a signal to another member of their species or to a prey item even or to a predator. And that signal could be anything from like, I'm ready to mate to I'm really big and scary to I'm really just a rock. You know. David Gallo, who's going to be a guest, um, who's in, do you, have you met David yet? He's got um, a YouTube video, was at one time the third most viewed, uh, and it shows octopuses ch completely changing their color to literally look like the rock that they're on. And so talk a little bit about how they change color like that and texture. It's so cool. Amazing. It is so, so cool. So octopuses and other cephalopods, so that squid and cuttlefish and nautiluses, all have these organs called chromatophores in their skin. And they can have thousands to millions of them, depending on the species and the size of the animal. They're, they're almost microscopic, although if you look very closely at an animal's skin, you might see what look like little dots or pixels, and those are the chromatophores. And they have, each one, each chromatophore has a color. Um, so they have red chromatophores and black chromatophores and yellow chromatophores. And each chromatophore is like a sack of pigment of that color. And it's sort of like pixels on a computer screen. When you want a certain color in a certain area, you turn on the pixels of that color. And that's what they can do over their whole body at literally the speed of thought. Amazing. Uh, we have another question from Kathy. Would you stand over here so we can get you on camera, please, Kathy? Stand right there. Walk that way. Walk towards that lady. Perfect. <laughs> okay, good. Jump up and down. Good, good, Imagine. good. Imagine. Well done. Okay. Ah, uh, hi. Okay, so I, once again, have two questions. My first question is, how does boy meet girl? Because they live a solitary life, as you say. They move away from their parents quickly. And also, how long does boy live after he donates his arm? Um, second question is, how do you measure octopus intelligence? One hears that they are highly intelligent. How do we know that? Great. Thanks, Kat. Awesome questions. Thank you. I did not prep her ahead of time, I promise. These are just really good questions. Uh, so the questions of how boy meets girl and how long boy lives are still open for Argonauts. We, so we can make some guesses based on other octopuses because the sort of solitary lifestyle is common to almost all species of octopuses. So most of them have this challenge of as, an, as adults, they live alone, they eat alone. If they get too close, they often cannibalize each other. So how do they connect? Um, and what we have seen, what scientists have observed in a lot of species of octopuses is that when they are looking for a mate, they end up with this sort of, like they'll go out exploring um, and they'll find other individuals of their species and then do kind of a complicated communication that involves patterns and postures and behaviors, and they'll often mate at arm's length, um, literally. So other species of octopuses, the males always pass sperm along an arm, but it's usually not as enlarged as in Argonauts, nor mm. does it break off. But oh. they still have this, this specialized arm, so they'll reach across to deposit the sperm, presumably to keep themselves from getting eaten, to keep themselves as far away as possible from the beak that, that could destroy them. And so we can guess that Argonauts must have some way of seeking each other out, perhaps looking for chemical signals even, like hormones in the water, before they're close enough to have visual signals. But we don't know because it's happening way out in the ocean, we, and we don't know. Then the males, we think, die immediately afterwards. But again, we don't know. So you said that the Argonaut goes to the surface, oh, yeah. scoops we'll up some air, yeah. scoops up some air, and then goes down to meet specific gravity requirements so that it stays at that level. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that make it more prone to predation because it has to stay at one level? It can't go up and down? That's a good escape? question. Yeah, so they do have some flexibility. Um, there, it's not, it's not like a narrow band of just one or two centimeters. Like once that 
that air bubble is compressed a certain amount, they can move within a few meters. They can meters propel themselves up and down. Using okay. the jet, the jet okay. from the siphon. And they can also let out, they could burp and let out a little bit of air if they wanted to, as well as go back to the surface and get more. So they have some flexibility there. And I wanted to get back to intelligence, because Kathy had that second question about the intelligence of octopuses. And it is indeed, I think, one of the things that you hear about them, perhaps most often, that they're the most intelligent invertebrate, the most intelligent animal without a backbone. Um, and it brings up this question, how do you even measure intelligence, which is honestly something that I think we still don't have an answer for. I think that by asking it, we're finding out more about what we mean when we say that something's intelligent. L by looking for it in animals that aren't human, we end up sort of reflecting back on ourselves. What do we mean? Does it mean the ability to solve puzzles, which is often what's used um, in animal behavior to figure out if, for example, a crow can get food out of a jar of water by dropping rocks in to raise the water level which they have been shown to be able to do. Or an octopus, for example, can solve a maze to find food or open multiple layers of jars to find food. So uh, there's some problem solving. Problem solving is obviously very close to or related to or a part of intelligence. Um, there's memory. Memory is often studied as an aspect of intelligence, whether an animal has short-term or long-term memory, which octopuses also have. Um, so, and then and there's always sort of the raw data of how big is their brain, how many neurons do they have. And so on all of those metrics, if you want to call them that, octopus, the octopus species that we've been able to study, because as you may have sort of been picking up on, there are a lot of species that are difficult to study. In many ways, the Argonauts are still one of the most difficult, even though Jeanne was able to keep them in her aquariums, she couldn't observe mating. She couldn't actually find the males and put them in there, for example. But for the ones we've been able to study, they do tend to score high on every intelligence metric we can think of. So that's cool. So, uh, one other question about when they surface to get air, how often do they do that, and are they in danger when they do that? Those are fantastic questions that I don't know the answer to. It's, it's great to have honest interviewers, <laughs> interviewees. Um, listen, it has been so fascinating listening to you talk to us uh, about you know, the secret life of octopuses and everything else we didn't know or I didn't know beforehand. I appreciate the really thoughtful questions from, from our audience as well. And Dana, thank you so much for sharing your story with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Terrific. Thank you. been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.